uh, the Secret Court said no. They said that the, the FBI was overstepping its, um, uh, its mandate, that this wasn't foreign intelligence surveillance, this was more garden variety criminal investigation, and they said no, you, you, you can't have the order to do the secret surveillance. Well, um, the secret FISA Court of Appeals had never convened. So my, my organization, the ACLU, wanted to file what is called an amicus brief. It's a friend of the court brief uh, to say that, you know, there might be some problems with uh, the, the secret surveillance uh, request. And uh, they had a problem because they, they didn't know where to find the secret FISA Court of Appeals. Where is it located? So, but the, the ACLU has operations in every state of the union. They made a lot of phone calls and eventually got through to a court clerk who said, yes, the Secret FISA Court of Appeals will accept your amicus brief, but you're too late. They've already had the hearing. And indeed, they had, they had the hearing. It was, it was done in secret. There was one party in front of the court. It was the FBI, which had lost. And they were, they were making this appeal, and there was nobody on the other side to argue the other side of the case. But the court said, yes, we'll take your amicus brief. So the ACLU turned in its amicus brief and waited, and the outcome was that the secret FISA Court of Appeals ruled in favor of the government. So there was nobody left to appeal to the Supreme Court because there was only one party to the case. And besides, it's not really a surprise. Um, secret courts are supposed to rule in favor of the government. That's what secret courts are for. So this illustrates, I think, just a, a, a basic structural problem that we're looking at uh, in the United States, an idea that government in secret actually does endanger democracy. Um, there's a, a, a famous court ruling uh, out of the Midwest saying democracy dies behind closed doors. So um, we, we do want to strike the balance, but I think that, that illustrates the perils to the American system. Well, I just would add to that, if I may. There's another reason that we should be concerned about the Patriot Act, and that is it doesn't work. So what we have is we have a distraction. We have the distraction of a war on terror that supposedly is being fought, and there's a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of smoke, but at the end of the day, does it really work? And let me give you an example of how it's not working. <coughs> National security letters, what does that mean? That means that instead of a subpoena for bank documents and other sorts of records that you might want from a suspect, the FBI can, and many other agencies can send out a simple letter that says, give us those, is that better? Give us, give us, give us those documents voluntarily, um, but it's not really voluntary because if you don't, the government's gonna take some pretty serious action against you possibly. And most of the time, the banks and other institutions which rely on government for various uh, business aspects will give it. Here's the problem. Those national security letters are not filed in court. There is no grand jury. There is no judicial officer overseeing it. It's completely unilateral. The executive just decides, hey, I'm an FBI agent. I'm going for it. And there's no one else that's going to check whether it's legitimate or not, whether it's necessary. That's not my issue. That's a different issue. You know what my issue is? My issue is that the FBI didn't even follow its own procedures for the national security letters, meaning the FBI didn't even follow the, the Patriot Act in certain key respects. Now, how do I know that? It's all secret, so how the heck would I know that? I know it because the Inspector General of the United States, who is supposed to conduct audits of how federal government agencies work, conducted a, a, get, a, issued a scathing report last year front page of the New York Times and talked about the fact these national security letters are being issued in certain respects, not the majority of respects, but a significant minority of times outside of the procedures that were put in place to protect within the FBI how these things should be sent and when they should and when they shouldn't. Director Mueller, who is a director of the FBI, apologized publicly. There were hearings in Congress. So my point is, I don't like terrorists more than anyone. The ACLU believes that terrorism is the ultimate way of depriving somebody of their civil rights. Of course we're not in favor of terrorism, but we want a real war on terrorism. We want a war on terrorism that works. We don't want this sort of idea that we're doing something, do something, do anything, you know? 
There's an old saying, don't just stand there, do something. In this war, it should be, don't just do something, stand there and think. Make it something that's going to work. I, I've been, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Andy Matson. Unfortunately, I don't have the, um, the mental fortitude to debate an issue against a lawyer because I'm not a Juris Doctorate. Um, however, um, just, just in our daily lives, what I always say, what makes sense? At the end of the day, what's the common sense perspective? And, and to each of us, that's different. And from our last speaker, we talk about how, it, as the speaker just said, about how the ACLU views as terrorism as the, the worst deprivation of civil, civil rights. Yet, I, I also heard a few minutes ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I think I may be wrong, that this organization, the constitutional organization, was representing Osama bin Laden's driver? Yeah. Okay. Personally, I really don't give a hoot what goes on to Osama bin Laden's driver. Because if you're driving Osama bin Laden, you know what Osama bin Laden is doing. Okay? Um, I don't think anybody here really cares what happens to Osama bin Laden's driver. Um, because he knew what was going on. Or even she know, knew what was going on. Um, that's just looking at it from the common sense perspective. However, I will also say that if our laws do protect Osama bin Laden's driver, then I will fight and I would defend those laws with my life to protect his right, to defend his right to a inquiry of justice or to be held in a court of law. I think that's the common sense perspective on it. But to say that you're an organization that doesn't defend terrorism, if you're going to publicly state that you're going to defend Osama bin Laden's driver, you're defending terrorism. I, I, is there anybody here in the audience that would disagree? <laughs> okay. Pretty much reflective of what we stood after 9-11. 70% um, of Americans support it. Provisions brought forth by the Patriot Act. It's now slightly declining. I think it's somewhere around 50%. And that's the same, about the same ratio I'm seeing in my class that we're willing to give up. Uh, people are willing to give up civil liberties and civil rights. Our fundamental, uh, the fundamentals of what this country was founded on. Um, and those things that I've swore to defend and protect both in the local level and on the national level. Um, and I think you'll see that pendulum continuously swing towards the other side until the next incident occurs. And then you'll see what? You'll see the public outcry against the government wasn't doing enough. Um, this is a real hard balance, or something that we haven't defined our roles. Um, in, and we've got to find our roles. Uh, in the justice system uh, over the course of time. This is a new crime for us. Um, I, I don't think anything was passed with ill intent to hurt people. It may have fell underneath like uh, the emergency exception. That's why there was so many people supporting th th this act in the beginning. But unfortunately, as we all know here, we're going to swing the other way once, a once after another major incident occurs. I think it was, um, I believe it was one of the Federalist Papers, the Constitutional Lawyers said if uh, all men were angels and government would not be necessary. <laughs> I think that was the quote. <laughs> yeah. um, government in and of itself is comprised of men and women that are subject to human error and human failing. Um, one of the stories I told my class um, early on, I believe it was the first class, was recounting personal tale of someone that I had arrested during my time on the Joint Terrorism Task Force as an agent. And I remember this individual looked me in the eye and asked me a question uh, prior to his, uh, he's subsequently been deported for immigration violations as well as criminal violations. And he said to me, do you have kids? Well, we were fingerprinting him. And I said, it's none of your business. Why? He said, just let you, let you know, while you're teaching your kids how to read and write, I'm teaching mine how to kill yours. And he meant it. I still get a chill up and down my spine when I think about that mentality. But the thing to realize is this. Items like the Patriot Act, all right, are laws made by men and subject to human failing. Are they foolproof, concrete, without fault? Of course not. They have problems. But they have certain things that I think, at the end of the day, um, have aided, and I understand my colleague here 
talks about the war on terror or